Hey guys, it's Biggs. Welcome back. Thanks for all the support, guys. Absolutely loving it. You guys are always hitting the subscribe button. You're sharing it out with your friends and stuff. So actually from the heart, I'm actually touching you guys are loving this content as much as I love putting it out for you. So thank you very, very much. Today's video is a little bit different, a little bit, maybe a little bit creepy. Maybe to some of you it might be a little bit macabre, but it is something that's actually been near and dear to my heart. It brings me back to my days in university and then all the stuff that I was connected with fishes back in the day. Now, when we were down visiting uh, in Florida, uh, we went up to an area called Gainesville, Florida. Now, up in Gainesville, Florida is where the labs are for uh, Dr. Thomas Waltzik, a dear friend of ours. And uh, he gave us a bunch of tours around and we saw some amazing, amazing cool stuff. But uh, one thing that we, weren't, we, we didn't know about, but he had set up for us, and he just, he, I, I think he had an inkling of how excited I would be. And uh, once I kind of tell you guys and show you what this video is going to be about, you might kind of go, oh, that's kind of creepy, Biggs, why are you so excited about that? But it doesn't matter, it was really, really cool. But we got to go into the basement, into the bowels of the natural, the Florida Museum of Natural History, and we got to spend uh, a good several hours with this guy here, Mr. Robert Robbins, one of the authors of this amazing book, Fishes of Freshwaters of Florida. A, a wonderful, wonderful tome, and it was personalized for me. And this was a gift from my dear friend, Mr. Thomas Waltzik. And I, you know, I absolutely cherish this. It was really, really cool. Thank you very much, my friend. But what we did is we got to go down into the fish labs and we got to explore the fish collection. That may not sound super exciting to you, but it's super exciting to me. So you should be excited. Because I told you so. But you guys got to check it out. I spent hours there. They basically, the people I was with just basically wandered off and did their own thing and talked to another is They just, just leave him alone. He's in his own element there. He's playing. And I, I went down aisle after aisle after aisle. It brought back so many memories. Got to see all this different stuff. But I got to see one particular thing that absolutely blew my mind to see it. And I'm saving that for the very, very end. The fish that absolutely, wow, I've never seen one of those before. I know it's has made it into the trade extremely rarely. I know like a couple of people that have ever even seen it or had it. But uh, it's probably one of the rarest of the rarest of cichlids there. I kind of let it a little bit out of the bag. I saw all sorts of other stuff besides cichlids. But I saw what, in my opinion, one of the absolute rarest of the rarest cichlids in this collection. And I'm going to leave that one to the end. So stay tuned, guys. Hope you enjoy my little tour of the bowels, the basement, the underground lair underneath the Florida Museum Natural History Museum. I'm Rob Robbins. I'm at the Florida Museum of Natural History where I work as the ichthyology collection manager. We're standing in the cichlid aisle, so we... Most got, important aisle. They're pretty great fishes, <laughs> there's no doubt. They're so great, they're so popular that unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, a lot of them have gotten loose into the open waters of Florida. Yep. We've got some 20 species or so that are established in Florida. And what we have in this aisle is a really good representation of that invasion of Florida's yep. waters. So, quite a diversity. Yeah, you got the Texas cichlid and the Managuents and Oscars and peacock bass, never yep. seems to end. Midas cichlids, acaras, a whole variety of things. And of course, if you go on social media, like Instagram and the like, mm -hmm. you'll see new reports of introduced fishes to Florida all the time. Oh, yeah. and the Salvanize question, here, all the, the Amphilophus types are all now, yeah. they're all entrenched. Well, Europe the question is how many more of them will become established in Florida? And then more to the point, what their impact might be. Right? Every time there's a hurricane and inland flooding, it moves fish around, right? So yeah. that's, that's fascinating. A lot of these animals that come from the tropics, their reproductive biology is tied to flooding, seasonal cycles of flood. Mm -hmm. And a prime example of that is Hopa sternum literale, the, the brown hopa, the yep. catfish. Those things, as a matter of course, go up in the floodplain when it floods, right? And they reproduce, they have those big bubble nests full of eggs. Yep. And we think that's how they colonize the state in some 20 years they were across the entire planet. and they're a very fast reproducer and the easy success and they can handle areas that have very very, very low dissolved oxygen so they can capitalize because they're a labyrinth organ yeah, yeah. They're, they're amazing creatures and again we have all these specimens as a record of that change to the state and an ability for future scientists to to study that change yeah i remember back in the day i was keeping uh, clarius batricus and I bred them, and it was really fascinating watching because it was a fish that was never commonly bred in an aquarium. But I remember breeding them and watching their behavior and everything, and I wrote a large article 
and the magazine refused it because it was considered a noxious species in the States. Like, who would think of a fish literally leaving water? Right, right. <laughs> it's fascinating that it would be precluded just because of someone's bias against its habits, Yeah. right? But like, a, for a fish to leave water, you can understand if it lived in the African savanna, where it, you know, it does come from, and if, if, if the area were drying up, it would leave for that purpose. But here in Florida, when the water doesn't disappear, that species spread all over your state for no rhyme or reason. It just left water. Yeah, well, if you don't like the place you're in and you have the ability to leave, <laughs> off you go, right? And for sure, I mean, a lot of fishes do get stuck in really mucky holes. I've collected clarius in some pretty bad spots, and you get the impression probably the ones that could leave had left. And, yeah. Yeah. Trying to get away from the alligators. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Okay, Ron, this is a pretty impressive collection. I, you know, I, I've been the one that in my town is nowhere near this, and it's this whole modern system. But do you have any idea how many specimens there actually are in the fish catalog? Do I have any idea? That's my yeah. job to know, right? Yeah. So this is one of the largest collections of fishes preserved in alcohol anywhere in the world, right? Okay. There's about two and a half million specimens. We're not so much interested in the total number of specimens as we are the diversity of fishes we have here available for study. And so there's about 8,000 species represented from all over the world. But our emphasis as the Florida Museum of Natural History has been the southeastern United States, particularly Florida. Yeah. And that's reflected in the book we just put out on fishes in the freshwaters of Florida. Book plug, right? And <laughs> more recently, a lot of research has been done of all places in Southeast Asia, freshwaters of Southeast Asia. Okay. So the curator of fishes, Larry Page, has had success in getting funding to study undescribed taxa in Southeast Asia, an emphasis on catfishes and minnows, and they're there now, 13th trip in about 13th years, I think, 13 years. When yeah. was the collection started? Because I've seen some ancient looking jars dating back sure. to the 50s. Yeah, <laughs> well those may even predate the, the collection itself, but we the Florida Museum of Natural History became the State Natural History Museum in 1917, so we just had our centennial celebration a couple years back. But the fish collection itself really got off the ground and grew rapidly in the last 30 or 40 years. Okay. So if you'd come in here 30 or 40 years ago, you would have seen a tenth the amount of material here. Yeah. And the one thing I would speak to about our rapid growth is that we didn't go out and collect everything. We didn't go out and kill everything ourselves. We're not out you know, murdering fish out of some kind of <laughs> bloodlust, right? We are in part this big because a lot of other institutions relinquished their collections, gave them to us because they could no longer afford to maintain them. So as the State Natural History Museum, we've had right of first refusal for those kinds of scientific collections, and we never refused. We took them all and have tried to get them modernized, digitized, and available. Because this has to be climate controlled, not only that, also to be light controlled because over time the specimens do deteriorate in, in uh, ethanol, or what is it, formalin, and that's why you guys have started making the switch over to ethanol. You, you said it, right? So historically, Natural history collections that are wet preserved, fluid preserved, if done right, fixed in formalin for just a limited amount of time because formalin is very low pH and will dissolve bone. Also, it's a carcinogen, it's nasty, you don't want to be around it. So, at most like a month in formalin if you're doing things right, rinse it all out with water, process that formalin as waste through your local regulatory agency, mm -hmm. and then preserve the specimens long term in alcohol. And it's been isopropanol for us historically, but like you alluded to, ethanol in the last 15 or 20 years because that's a better preserver. It doesn't clear, it doesn't discolor it or anything like that. You get more better representation of the species. We think you get a better long-term specimen. One yeah. of the unfortunate aspects of preserving things in alcohol if you killed them is they don't look very good, right? Yeah. You wouldn't either. So yeah. what we try to do these days in this digital era that we're in, right, is take photographs of things when they're alive, capture that color before they become a specimen, and associate those images with the specimen records online in our online mm -hmm. database. Well, I did, uh, I did do a, an interview. Do you know a gentleman named Dr. Ron Oldfield? And the name is familiar yeah. to me. He did, his, uh, did most of his work with uh, one particular species of Herichthys from Cyanogatatus, in, or uh, sorry, uh, Quatrocinigus in Mexico, and it was Herichthys minclei, ah. which is a protected area. And uh, Kapil, I saw Kapil's name here, Mandrakar. I saw his name on different things throughout the collection, stuff like that. He's a very good friend of his. And I put that his work, did an interview with him, put his work out there, and I associated it with the specimens that he had. And the hobbyists, who base everything on strictly color, you know, it doesn't look like my fish, it didn't breed like my fish, those guys just went crazy over yeah. it, and not in a nice way, which is really the reason. It's sad that, you know, that's the reason a lot of the academics don't bring that information to the hobbyists. They publish it in professional circles, 
and that's just where it is. Well, I would say both groups are, uh, stand to teach each other something, yes. right? And I have, over my career, been very fortunate to learn a lot from hobbyists or quote-unquote amateurs, and uh, recent studies that we've done have actually been co-authored with people who aren't being paid on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. to study fish like I am. And so whenever we get a chance to, uh, to collaborate like that. Uh, well, that's why, to me, to me, that was the whole point of me doing the channel and stuff was that to go and see the things that a lot of people wouldn't see or may not really want to yeah. see, but kind of showing them why it's interesting, why it's important, yeah. you know, and then bringing that scientifics down in a, in a way that people, the average person or average hobbyist can kind of go, I understand that now. It makes total sense to me. Yeah. not saying they're dumber. It's just no, they not, view things in a different way. Not in the least. And they have access to a lot of information that, I don't have access to because I'm just one person standing in this building yep. and I'm not a thousand sets of eyes running around out in the wild and observing stuff in nature. Yeah, and uh, fish in jars don't tend to show off a lot of their behaviors very well, exactly. breeding structures and so forth. So yeah, thanks again. Sure thing. So I'm just wandering the aisles looking at jars and stuff like that and I'm checking out everything. I'm totally in my element. Now, for those that are not, maybe not uh, ichthyologists or, you know, worked in these type of situations before, this is the way that most science is actually done of how we can work with fishes. Now, as he mentioned, as, as Rob mentioned, we, he, he, we can take pictures and work with living specimens that way to learn behavioral traits, and that's how aquarists can often help. But it comes down to using those preserved fish that we can then dissect and look at different things and count different things using morphometrics and, and things that are tangible, morphometrics and metrics and such. And these things are how we all describe fish. Now with the advent of using DNA, this is very important too. So it's changing, it's always evolving, but having these massive collections are absolutely critical to evolving so we can learn more and more about these fishes. Now, as I'm just wandering around, I find this one particular jar. One specific jar out of, as he said, over 8,000 specimens, over 2 million total specimens. I'm just absolutely blown away by this one jar. And here it is. So this jar that we're talking about in question actually holds one of the true endemic cichlids from the island of the Caribbean island of Cuba. Now everyone knows the Cuban cichlid that has the common name Cuban cichlid is Nandopsis tetracanthus. Beautiful fish, well entrenched in the hobby, it's available readily. There is one other one though, however, and it's called Nandopsis ramsdeni. I personally have never seen them in the flesh. However, they have entered the trade. Uh, they've been in Europe and a few dedicated Europeans such as Uvi Werner. Uh, Uvi wrote a, a wonderful article on them in Cichlid News a few years back. Jeff Rapps had it back in 2005, and in speaking with Mr. Mo Devlin, he had the, he had a nice big pair of which you know pictures were provided, but they never ended up actually spawning for them. I do know of a few people in Ohio that have kept them, but otherwise than that, we're talking a very small handful of people, and I doubt very much that the fish is is available in the trade at all anymore. Collecting the fish. Originally, it came from a very, very isolated kind of area. It lives up in higher mountain, higher elevations, in colder water streams. Water temperatures right down to about 70, 72 degrees. So it's much cooler than most of the average fish. Uh, there's a problem being that we face with fishes all over the world as there's been introduced tilapies, tilapias and tilapines into the different regions, and they are out-competing uh, the ranges for these fish. Uh, this particular fish, Rams Denai, is actually a very shy, it's elusive, it looks like a big mean cichlid, but it's exactly the opposite of that. It gets to be about a foot in size, but it just cannot handle its own against the more prolific and more aggressive tilapias or the tetracanthus. So this fish has kind of been uh, almost eradicated out of most of its home range. Uh, a lot of the range still is listed as that it comes from the, the Rio Tao in, Chile, in uh, Cuba. Uh, the only problem being is a lot of the original range for this fish is very, very close, uh, also in the Rio Guantanamo, and you think of the name Guantanamo, especially if you're an American, that's Guantanamo Bay, and that's an extremely secure and protected uh, military base. So I think anybody showing up with a couple of fish nets, hey, we just want to go and sample, I don't think that's going to be met very well, and I don't think you're going to have a lot of success. This fish was... Um, it's, it's a readily caught fish back in the day. It was a very, very readily consumed fish as cichlids or larger cichlids all over New World are often used as food fishes. The agricultural, the Ministry of Agriculture of Cuba actually took thousands of these individuals and dispersed them all over the island. However, they must have done the same thing with tilapia and they must have done the same thing with black bass. And those two species have probably almost completely eradicated Ramsdenite from the island. So hopefully that this fish is still there. 
Hopefully one day we can get those fishes out, some of them, and get them into the trade. And possibly some dedicated hobbyists in the world can kind of get these things going so they don't go disappearing like uh, a lot of other fishes have before them. So hopefully there's a, a happy ending to this. But with this, I can still tell you guys, I was extremely excited to find that jar. I sure hope you guys enjoyed today's video. It was a little bit different, and it was to me totally in my element, and I had an absolute blast. I wouldn't be possible if I didn't uh, if I didn't thank some very dear friends. Dr. Thomas Waltzik graciously showed us around everywhere. Uh, Sandy Moore from Seagrest, a dear friend and my host for the entire week. And Mr. Robert Robbins, uh, who was my host in taking us around this fish lab. I had an absolute blast. Thank you very much. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care.